We need a, a little more light on you, too. So, um, Chris, the house lights. Mm -hmm. Is this better? That's good. Yes. Okay. Either hold it or place the mic. Welcome back. And um, my next, um, the next speaker that I'm really pleased to introduce is Leanne McNabb. Many of you know her if you come to the library, well, several years ago to do genealogy. Uh, I, Leanne originally started at the library as a part-time library assistant in our department. And I don't think I've ever gone to an interview for a librarian or an LSA, as we refer to them, uh, where anyone was so well prepared with regard to genealogy. She brought all of her notebooks and fascinated us with her research and really became the expert, a go-to person, almost immediately. Uh, we reluctantly let her go to other departments and to go to library school where she got her MLS, and she now works in the popular library, um, and hopefully one day she'll work her way back to our department. Um, but anyway, it's with, my, with great pleasure that I do introduce Leanne and Pat. Um, can everyone hear me? No? Now, yes. Okay. Thank you for being here with me today. Um, mm -hmm. There are two handouts plus the PowerPoint, um, so just make sure that you got those. If you did not, you can see Chris Smith over here standing, and he can get one for you. Um, many of the print resources listed in the handout are available in the public, uh, in the genealogy and local history department here at the public library. Uh, not all of the databases listed are available here, though some of them are. Um, Ancestry.com, for instance, is available through any branch of the public library of Cincinnati, Hamilton County. Neither the handouts nor the presentation are meant to be exhaustive. Um, there are other genealogical gems out there to be found in print, online, and at um, archives. Um, before we delve, dive into online research for Irish genealogy, I want to do a brief overview of online research, some of the basic sources of genealogical information on Irish immigrants on this side of the pond, and the types of Irish records usually used to call genealogical information. I will have time for questions after the presentation if you should have any, so let us begin. As most of you know, online research is great. <laughs> it is convenient. Um, there are some valuable resources available that will help your research, research and flexible search tools. For instance, being able to search by um, an approximate birth year, uh, a first name only, say for instance, you can't find the person by the last name, whereas print resources often will allow those sort of um, searching capabilities. But of course, not all resources are yet available online. And um, finding your ancestors may require you to order microfilm records into your local family history center, or um, to hire a professional researcher, or to order records from Ireland. Um, of course, with online records, especially indexes, um, transcription errors can, can occur. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I think we've all come across a situation where we searched for one of our ancestors in the census, even here in the States. Um, but we just cannot find them. Um, so it's just a good reminder to know that there are several reasons why maybe we can't find our ancestors in records. Um, you know, for instance, there may not be any church records in your ancestor's hometown for the time that they were born or married. Um, that could be due to fire, war, um, neglect, short-sighted public officials, discrimination, poverty, or there might just be misspellings. That might be the reason we can't find them in an online database. Um, be open-minded when you look at spellings. If you see a surname that is um, pronounced phonetically the same way as your surname, but maybe spelled slightly different, I would definitely take note of that. Um, make sure uh, to search databases using the many varieties that you've come across. Uh, most uh, databases online do allow you to do sound and phonetic searches, but not all of them do. So create a list of the variations, use it, and update it whenever possible. Um, 
as any of you may be familiar with conducting research here in Hamilton County, it's not just foreign records that we need to worry about these fires and wars. Uh, here in 1884, in our own courthouse, there was a fire and many records were lost. Let's switch gears to a brief overview of the Irish American Family History uh, Resources. I would um, suggest that you start your research here before going to Ireland to do research. And when I say go to Ireland, I don't mean physically, I just mean before you start looking at Irish records. Um, though, of course, if you want to go to Ireland, by all means, do it. But um, <laughs> um, work your way backwards from yourself, make a chart, write down everything that you know, use the resources here, including the US Census, wills, vital records, land records, church records, immigration records, military records, obituaries, and even more obscure records. I've given out two pamphlets with print and online resources, as well as local, national, and international institutions that may be able to assist you in your research. What sort of obscure US records am I talking about other than the main ones that I just mentioned? <coughs> I would say gravestone inscriptions, local almanacs, local libraries, local historical societies, distant relatives, and even much more. I'll tell you very briefly how I found the county of origin for my ancestor, Patrick McNabb. I went to a small library in Petersburg, Indiana, the county that he lived in. He lived in Pike County, Indiana. I found an old almanac from the 1890s, and each person was listed according to township. The name was given, their occupation, how much land they own, how long they've been in Pike County, how long they've been in the United States, and then their place of birth. I couldn't find it in the census. I couldn't find it on death records. You know, all the places that we would love to find that information, I found it in a, a small book that could only be found there at that library. And it said that his place of birth was County Down, Ireland. So that's what I mean by obscure sources. Sometimes you have to look at more than just the, the you know, vital records and wills and such. Um, now let's talk about Irish, basic Irish sources used to call genealogical information. As you know, since 1922, the island has been split between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, the location of records for those doing Irish genealogy may be spread throughout modern United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, therefore. The same can be said about online databases in some cases. This is one of the many reasons that narrowing your place of origin down to at least the county level before uh, looking at Irish um, and uh, UK databases is advisable, if possible, though it's not always possible, I realize. However, don't worry, later we will discuss strategies to help you narrow down a place of origin um, if you've exhausted all avenues here in the United States and still haven't found that information. These are the most common, though by no means the only genealogical resources to use in Ireland. Um, we have the 1901 and 1911 census records, the various census substitutes, church records, gravestones, military records, passenger lists, school records, vital records, and wills. These are listed alphabetically, but by no means by importance. Um, over the next several slides, we will discuss these various resources in detail, whether they are available online, and if so, where they are available online. Much like the United Kingdom, the census was taken in Ireland since 1821. Sadly, the census returns for 1861 through 1891 were destroyed by the government for use as scrap paper, mostly during World War I. Not too long after World War I, the census returns for 1821 through 1851 were destroyed during the Irish um, Rebellion in 1922. There are a few census fragments that exist, but most of the censuses prior to 1901 are gone. Um, to see a list of the census fragments, visit www.irish-genealogy-toolkit.com slash population-census.html. That is on one of the handouts that I have given you. Um, and so you're thinking, there ends our ambitions for use of census records in Ireland. Um, but I know it looks bleak. But for those of you who weren't able to narrow down a place of origin for your ancestors prior to going over there, the 1901 census can be used to find surname pockets. So if you search the 1901 census for just a surname, 
and get a list of all the places that surname uh, occurred, you look where the largest pockets are, and that might give you a clue on where to look next or where to focus your efforts. So let's talk about where you can find the 1901 census and the 1911 census returns online. There are several places to access the 1901 and 1911 census records online. Some sites have abstracts, some have indexes, and, only, and then some only cover like local areas. Others have access to everything. Today we're going to focus this part of the presentation on the National Archives of Ireland. Um, they have the 1901 and 1911 census records available for search for free. This is the main page of the National Archives of Ireland's genealogy website. You can see the search box, which lets you narrow down the, your search by surname, first name, county, townland and, uh, or street, as well as the district electoral divisions age and sex. I have decided to search for solely uh, by the McNabb surname to see the distribution pattern throughout Ireland. After clicking the search button, I get the first page of results. In the 1901 census, there are 253 entries for McNabb in Ireland. I have the option of showing all the results on one page if I like. If I'm trying to see a surname distribution, I would suggest that technique because then it will line up and you can see everything. You can click where it says county and then it will give you um, the results in county order. So all the results for one county are right next to each other. Unfortunately, I didn't take a screenshot of that because I couldn't actually fit a whole, all 253 results onto the page and to show you how that would work. <laughs> But, um, you know, that is a very good way. Um, we can see, for instance, that the top entries are for Antrim, which is in Northern Ireland. But if you keep going through the list, it'll go alphabetically by county. Um, if you want to look at a specific entry, you would just click the highlighted hyperlink for, for instance, James McNabb. And it will take you um, to a transcription of the household information for that particular individual. It will give the age, sex, relationship to the head of household, the religion, the birthplace, um, usually just county, though sometimes you get lucky and there's more. Occupation, whether or not the individual is literate, uh, and whether they know the Irish language, what their mar marital status is, and whether anyone in the household is suffering from an illness. To the lower left side of the screenshot, you'll see the option to view the census image right there, we can see these images. Okay. Um, whether you are looking at Irish or American records, I would definitely suggest that you look at the originals always. As I said before, transcriptions can be incorrect. So you, you know, or sometimes handwriting is hard to read and maybe the transcriber just had a hard time with it. So it's really good to look at the original. And then when you do that with a, with a online record, you can zoom in and out to get a better reading of what that might say if it's hard to read. Um, there are several types of documents that can be used as census substitutes for the years prior to 1901. So let's talk about those next. While this look, list does look exhaustive or extensive, <laughs> many of these census substitutes are of limited use depending on where your ancestors are located. Some only cover certain areas of Ireland, Others cover only certain classes or religions. I will discuss each of them briefly. These 1630 muster rolls are a list of large land floors in Ulster, and Ulster only, with the names of able-bodied men that could be used to form militia if necessary. These men were from 16 to 50 years of age and were usually not Catholic. The 1654 through 1656 civil survey contains details on ownership, wills, and deeds relating to land title, as well as descriptive topographical information. It only survives for counties Cork, Derry, Donegal, Dublin, Kildare, Kilkenny, Limerick, Meath, Tipperary, Tyrone, Waterford, and Wexford County. It is held at the National Library of Ireland. The 1659 census of Ireland only enumerated those with title to land, and it's important to remember that the majority of uh, Irish citizens did not own land at that time. 
So if your ancestors were not landowners, they will not be listed in this resource. The 1660 poll tax returns contain a list of people who paid the tax levy on every person 12 and older. The list includes the individual's name, occupation, and age. These records cover mostly Ulster. The hearth money rolls list all householders paying tax on hearths. Sadly, only half of the county's uh, records survived. Free transcripts for Irma, Sligo, Monaghan, and Louth are available at www.belterromehat.com, another one of the um, links listed on the handout. The convert rolls taken from 1703 until 1838 consist of those taking the oath of allegiance and therefore often converting from Catholicism to the Church of Ireland. The right to own property and land was restricted to non-Catholics for a time. Many wealthy Catholics therefore converted to keep their lands. The bulk of entries date from 1760 to 1790. They are held at the National Archives of Ireland and the National Library of Ireland. <coughs> Excuse me while I get a drink. The 1775 petition of Protestant dissenters, which obviously only lists Protestants, is searchable on Prony's website, Prony being the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. And you can search for free on their website. Their website is also listed on the handout. To encourage the linen trade, free spinning wheels or looms were being granted to individuals by the government when a certain area of land with flax was planted. The list includes more than 60,000 people, the list only records the name of the individual and a civil parish within which they live. The majority of these entries are for Ulster, though names from all of Ireland can be found. On ancestry, there's an uh, sorry, there's an index on ancestry.com, which, as mentioned previously, can be accessed through the public library of Cincinnati, Hamilton County. The um, a free transcript of this list can be found at the feltorromehat.com website that I previously mentioned and is on your handout. 1863, sorry, Griffith's primary evaluation is a mid 19th century survey of Irish land occupiers. Together with the tithe apartments of the 1820s and 1830s, they are the, one of the best ways of localizing surnames and working out where in Ireland your ancestors may have come from. Unless your last name's Murphy, then it might be a little <laughs> They are housed at the National Archives of Ireland and Prony. Also, Ancestry.com has a transcribed index and sites such as Felter Rome had again, UlsterAncestry.com, and IrishOrigins.com have some, if not all, of the images available for a fee. The 1876 landowners list records over 32,000 landowners in Ireland by province and county. Each entry includes name and address of the owner, along with the valuation of the property. Once again, it's important to remember that not everyone uh, that worked a piece of land actually owned it so that you know, ancestors may not appear. You can access these records at Ancestry.com or view them on, once again, www.filterromhat.com. I know this is an exhaustive list, sorry guys. Um, the 1908 old age pension claims can be viewed online at www.pensar.org for a fee. What these are is in 1908, the government um, passed an old age pension for those who could prove their age. Well, because Civil registration didn't begin in Ireland until 1864. Um, the way that they were going to prove their age was to have the census bureaus look for their entries in the early records, the early census. And at that time, of course, the census records were still around for them to do so. So say a person wanted this pension, they would say, please search for me and my family in the 1841 census, and we'll use that as proof of my age. Well, those census abstracts that were pulled out for the old age, pension, old age pensions do survive. So there are some abstracts that survive from the earlier census records. And those can be um, searched uh, online and uh, at many local repositories. The 1912 Ulster Covenant can be searched and viewed at Prony's site for, fee, uh, for free. I'm sorry. The covenant was signed by just under a half million uh, unionists. It provides the address of the signer and their name, of course. But don't be surprised to see signers outside of Ireland. There will be signers from Canada, from the United States, uh, Australia, 
a lot of immigrants, uh, people that immigrated out of Ireland signed that as well. Many of these census substitutes can be found in a variety of places online, including Ancestry.com, Family Search, Irish Origins, Prony, and RootsIreland.ie. Only two of those that I've mentioned, um, Prony and Family Search, um, are free. No single site, to my knowledge, has all of these census substitutes uh, searchable for the whole island on them. Um, there may be transcriptions of these records on small websites all over the web. Um, but even if they're found, because they are transcriptions with no images, looking at the originals is still suggested. Prony um, only covers records for Northern Ireland, so their website usually just has uh, records that cover Northern Ireland, whereas um, the General Registers Office of Ireland or um, the Public Records Office in Dublin will have many of the records for the remainder of Ireland. <clears throat> Um, I'd like to remind you that you're able to use Ancestry Library Edition through any computer located at a branch of the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. Um, I have included a, a link to an in-depth list of census substitutes. It's even more in-depth than this. I only included sources that, for instance, covered more than one county. But this link right here will give you even those resources that only cover a small area, like a, a specific town or just one county. So it's worth taking a look at. Let's take a brief look at Prony's website to see how we can access the freeholders list and the Ulster Covenant. This is the homepage of the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland. On both the left and the right side bars, there are helpful links to assist in site navigation and links that lead to databases and other useful tips for the family historian. Um, you'll see a link for visiting or searching at Prony, uh, as well as suggestions for family and local history on the left side. On the right side bar, it says online records. You'll see Ulster Covenant, Freehold Records, Street Directories, Will Calendars, Name Search. Um, so that is how you access those. So let's do a, a quick run through of their Freeholder database and how it's used. When you click on any of the databases on their website, you're going to come to a very nice introduction that explains why the records were taken and what its information is contained within the records. On the <coughs> right-hand side, you'll see the big button that says search the freeholders' records. You click on that and are taken to a search screen. I usually search by surname only and try alternate spellings as well. Um, but of course, feel free to try different uh, search techniques for yourself. After clicking or entering the surname and any other information, um, I would click Find, and it takes you to the result page. But notice the option for advanced search in case you would like to do more advanced search. Of course, once again, I'm searching for Big Map. I know. Here is a list of results. Um, we can see there are 12 results for the last name McNabb in the freeholder records. Um, it lists address, first name, surname. And then on the right hand side, if you want to view the original, which we all know by now, because <laughs> I always say that, um, click on the red arrow that is next to the name, and um, you'll be taken to the original record. So this is what the original freeholder record looks like. It includes the name of the freeholder, the place of the home, the location of the home, the name of the landlord, because some of these people obviously were not the landowners themselves, um, other people living in the freehold, and the date and place of registration. I want to say that in that second to last major column, um, it's supposed to be people, other people that have an interest in the freehold or that live on the freehold, not everyone's always listed. And the reason I know that is because if you look at my entry for Patrick McNabb, which actually is kind of hard to see in here, I'm sorry about that, um, it only lists three names for Patrick McNabb's landlord. Patrick McNabb, Patrick McNabb, and Patrick McNabb. <laughs> I'm sure there were some women living on this property. You know, my ancestor, was, right. <laughs> my ancestor was a child at the time he was, this was taken, and his own father's name was Patrick McNabb. So, you know, two of the Patricks, I know who they are. Who the third one is, who knows, maybe it's 
father of the father, and I haven't found other records to substantiate that yet in my own research. But there are no females listed, and we definitely know that there were females in the family. So be cautious with that. Just because your ancestors' females in the family don't no, appear right there doesn't mean they were like absent or had passed away or anything of that nature. Oh, okay. okay never mind. There's a close up. I knew I had that in there. So, yeah, you can see Patrick McNabb is the second to last. He was in Kintock. Craig Rodden. His landlord was William Maxwell. And there you see the other two Patricks, Patrick McNabb and Patrick McNabb. So, um, you know. <laughs> and you'll notice, actually, if you, if you look through all of them, though, there are very few females listed. And that's what I mean. So don't be alarmed if there isn't a female listed. That doesn't mean that they weren't around. Um, also, you'll notice that there are no relationships listed. It just lists people's names. There's no relationships. You know, is that a son? Is it an uncle? Is it a cousin? You know, you have no idea. But this is still a very useful census substitute. And like that, as we mentioned before, a way to localize a name if you weren't able to do so here in the States before heading across the, uh, the pond to look at Irish records. Um, next, I'll show you how to find the title plot and books for the Republic of Ireland on FamilySearch.org which you'll find listed on my handout. Of course, you can always use their main search page on FamilySearch.org and enter as much data as you know about the individual that you were searching for to see, you know, any records that pop up with the names. Of course, they've got so many databases on um, Family Search. But if you want to search solely in specific Irish record databases, follow these steps. Um, this is the top of their main page, so you'll want to scroll down to the bottom until you see the map of the world. Right there. Under Browse by Location, you'll see United Kingdom and Ireland. So you would want to click on that. This takes you to a list of all of the databases for both the United Kingdom and Ireland. You can see it says that there's 101 collections. Uh, it lists how many records are in each database and the last time that database was updated. So some of the records um, are not, I wouldn't say all the databases are 100% complete, but sometimes you can notice there's small numbers of records in the database. But if we want to narrow down even further to just Ireland, here on the left hand side of the place, we can click Ireland. You'll see a list of all the searchable databases on Ireland. There are only seven at this time. They're always expanding. You may find more pretty soon. At the very bottom of the list, you'll see the title plotman books of 1814 to 1855. Um, as mentioned previously, the title book records the name of the occupier, the townland, the acreage, the classification of land, the amount of the tithe, and the landlord's name. There are a few downfalls to the title plotman books. Names are given with no indication of familial relationship, once again, just like the three folder records. Also, in some areas, the arable land is of such poor quality that no tithe could be collected. They couldn't tax the people living on it, and therefore they may not appear in the records, those individuals. Um, on the screen, you'll notice there's other databases offered, offered by um, FamilySearch. I would suggest using the ones mainly that have the little camera icon next to them, because those are the ones that contain images so you can verify the transcriptions. The only um, Exception to that is I would say, still go ahead and take a look at the civil registration indexes from 1845 to 18, uh, I'm sorry, 1958, because that can also be a good way to localize a surname, to see you know, who, where people were being born, you know, uh, and find pockets of the surname. When you click on, for the tithe of plot and books, you are taken to the following search screen. So it's a search screen that's specific just for that particular database. From here, you can enter as much or as little information as you would like. Much like Prony's site, Prony being the public record office of Northern Ireland, uh, you'll be taken to a result with a uh, list of results with accompanying images. It's much like what we just saw with Prony, so I won't go through that step by step. Um, so let's move on to church records. The main denominations in Ireland are Catholic, Church of Ireland, Methodist, Presbyterian, and Quaker. There are other religions and Christian denominations that have or have had a presence 
in Ireland. I would suggest taking a look at a book called Tracing Your Irish Family History by Anthony Adolph that is on the list of resources. Um, for more information on faiths, other faiths in Ireland, and where the records can be located, most church records are not available online, but are available through the county heritage centers uh, for a fee. Each county in Ireland usually has a heritage center, um, which is easily found online if you sort of search, you know, whatever county, County Mayo, and the Heritage Center will come up for you. Uh, later in the presentation, I also will show you how to find a list of all those. Um, there are a few exceptions about the online church records, such as Ulster Historical Foundation's uh, database for Antrim and County Down, for both those counties, at www.ancestryireland.com. Family search at a small number of Irish registers indexed, uh, but not fully transcribed. So you might find an in index, but not get the full record. Um, coverage for Catholic records on familysearch.org is sparse. Um, in general, surviving Catholic registers start in the mid-18th century. Most parish registers are still held at the parish level in Ireland. Uh, though most of them have been microfilmed, uh, and deposited at the National Library of Ireland or the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland. In 1871, the Church of Ireland records became state property um, and were collected at the Public op uh, Records Office in Dublin. Of course, what this means is sadly that in 1922, almost 1,000 registers were destroyed in the Irish um, Rebellion. However, 637 parishes did not do what they were supposed to do and had not deposited them you know, there like they were supposed to. So 637 registers still survive. Um, Church of Ireland registers have been kept since 1634, so for those parishes that did survive, the records may go back into the 17th century. The originals are held at the National Archives of Ireland, the Church of Ireland's representative church body, or the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. Most Methodists appear in Church of Ireland registers until 1816. When a split occurred among the Irish Methodists, I found that quite interesting when I was doing research that for a while they still showed up in the Church of Ireland registers. The primitive Methodists stayed with the Church of Ireland in 1816, while the Wesleyan Methodists started their own churches and began their own registers. However, in 1878, the primitive Methodists also decided to leave the Church of Ireland and reunited with the Wesleyans to create the Methodist Church of Ireland. Methodist registers in Ulster can be traced through the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, uh, and those for Ireland can be traced through the county heritage centers. Though many Presbyterian records will appear in the Church of Ireland registers, especially prior to the 19th century, Presbyterians kept their own registers mainly from 1819 forward. Quaker records are housed in either the Society of Friends Historical Library in Dublin or the Archives Committee of the Religious Society of Friends in Lisbon, Northern Ireland. If the area where your ancestor is not covered and any of these online resources, like say an Ulster Ancestry, you don't have ancestors in the Antrim or down, you can search the Latter-day Saints um, or Family History Center catalog and look for microfilm to see if registers survive from the area that your ancestors were from and order them into that uh, Family History Center for a fee. The type of information retained in baptismal, marriage, and burial records is different for each parish, of each religion, of each denomination. So you may want to familiarize yourself with common Latin terms in uh, records, especially Catholic, but not only Catholic, because at the very beginning of the Church of England and Church of Ireland, Ireland, they maintained keeping the records in Latin. Of course, they changed eventually through time. But um, when King Henry VIII uh, left Rome or said, Pope, you know, I'm not following the Pope anymore, he still considered himself Catholic and said, said as much. So the early records are a lot of times still in Latin. Next, we will briefly discuss military records. Um, I'm going to go mainly over the ones for here that are basically available online. Um, I mean, basically, the militia was started in the 16th century, but records are patchy. So, um, the muster rolls and pay books are located at the National Archives in the UK, but the um, army records are kept 
at the, well, they're all kept at the National Archives in the UK, but you can actually search the non-officer service records from 1760 through 1854 at the nationalarchives.gov.uk. So those records are available, the indexes are available to search online. And then of course, if you found the person you were looking for, you would have to order the record through the National Archives. The Royal Navy was started by King Henry VIII in 1546. The earliest muster rolls do not survive. However, the rolls from 1688 forward do. Uh, they are available for research at the archives, um, once again, at the National Archives of the UK. The indexes are free to search, however, to be rigorous, you must be paid. While there are numerous passenger lists for uh, ships arriving in the United States, there are less for those leaving the British Isles. Uh, really, the records post-1889 are held at the National Archives in the UK, but they're also available for search on www.ancestorsonboard.com. Once again, searching is free, but the index, um, I mean, the index is free, but to look at the individual records, there is a fee. Prior to that, using immigration records available through Ancestry.com or Ancestry Library Edition may yield some clues, but typically weren't taken by officials in the British Isles. As I'm sure many of you know, there were many places a ship could dock uh, here in the States, Philadelphia, New York City, Boston, New Orleans, and more. Typically, it wasn't until the late 1800s that an exact place of origin was listed on those documents. <coughs> As mentioned previously, the majority of vital records were not taken until 1864, the only exception being marriages, which started in 1845 for Protestants. For Catholics, this still started in 1864. But for Protestants, it began on April 1st of 1845. There are indexes available online at familysearch.org, ancestry.com, and more. And to order the pre-1922 records, I have uh, given you the link where you can place those orders online. Much like our own early vital records, the name of parents is often not recorded on early death records. So that's just um, a reminder that if you order them, you may not actually have parents' names on there. Wills. Only a small proportion of the population in Ireland actually had wills, usually the landowners. Um, the Church of Ireland was responsible for administering wills prior to 1858, and then after 1858, it went into the civil jurisdiction, um, and was taken at the, what were called district um, repositories, probate repositories. So many were destroyed in 1922, of course, but I have listed several sites that have online indexes. Um, Ancestry.com has quite a few. Um, and then if you want to look at the Public Records Office, website, they have many indexes. So even though the wills themselves were destroyed, some of them, the indexes survive, or if they were used in a will to sort of deal with a land transaction or inheritance, those survive as well often. Um, the will indexes for irishorigins.com start in 1484, but there is a fee to use that website. Let's discuss a few other sources of genealogical information in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Other places to harvest family industry gems include directories, Google, yes, I can say Google, gravestones, heritage centers, local histories, Macabo genealogy search engine, newspapers, and school records. Uh, I have the uh, pages listed for local history. Um, you can take a look at that uh, website. It basically gives you a list, mostly modern, but some historical local histories. Um, a list of every single newspaper that was printed in Ireland is the very first link under newspapers. And then if you want to look through um, the index for the Belfast newsletter, you can take a look at that free site there. There is a newer um, database called Irish Newspaper Archives. They don't have everything online yet, but that's their goal is to keep adding more and more. And they really do have some early records. There is a fee for that website, but I would keep my eye on that because it's a growing website. Um, State-run education began in Ireland in 1831. The enrollment registers may be useful as they record the full name of the student, his or her birth date, religion, father's address and occupation, though sadly not name, uh, details of attendance, academic progress, and the name of the school previously attended. Um, the 
Registers for the public record office are still held within the local school districts, but the teacher's salary books and administrative records are held at the National Archives in Dublin. Uh, the records for Northern Ireland are held at the public records office of Northern Ireland, Belfast. And I have a link there to um, more information on the Republic of Ireland's um, school records. Both old city directories and modern phone directories can be useful in your research. Historic directories can help us understand the communities within which our ancestors lived. What resources were at their disposal? What were the main forms of commerce in their area? What churches were nearby? Trade directories comprise the earliest of the directories in Ireland starting in 1750 in certain areas. The contents of the directory are often selective, so they may not include every uh, member of the population. In some cases, individuals would have to pay to be included in them. So often they excluded the small tenant farmers, landless laborers, and servants. Another good thing to remember about directories is that the information within them is six months to a year old because it's compiled before it's printed. Um, unless you are looking for the most common surnames, using a modern online directory, and you can see the second half of the slide there, I have the first ones for the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom, which of course includes Northern Ireland for the second. Um, you can use those uh, to see where surname name pockets occur once again. So you might want to use a few of the different sources I've mentioned for finding surname pockets and sort of gather the information together and then look where the majority are. Um, while this isn't a surefire way to find your sister's hometown, if you are stuck at a brick wall, it can provide clues. In order to use them, you do need to know a postcode, um, and we'll, the next slide will be about finding the postcodes for certain areas. And then last but not least, finding distant relatives. This method requires both online research as well as the tried and true methods of mailing things and paying for postage and writing letters. I have sent letters before to people in certain areas of County Down to search for family information. Um, I would suggest this method for your not so common Irish surnames. Uh, the majority of individuals do not respond. They may be suspicious and can you blame them? Uh, however, I always have a few that respond. Some of them are just nice letters letting me know they can't help me, um, and others actually give me information. Uh, a few tips when using this method. Always give information about yourself in the letter. It makes it more personal, doesn't seem as much like a scam or that you're trying to get something like money out of them. So I always like to include my age, my name, why I started doing family history research, what I've looked at, things like that. Um, and then include a SASE to something that they can mail back information to you so they don't have to pay for it. And there is um, the website I mentioned with the postcodes. You can get it on Wikipedia, and it'll actually have a little map there <coughs> and show what different postcodes are. So if, if you have been able to narrow it down to some level of a locale, like for instance, I knew my ancestor was from the coast of County Down, I would know which ones to search um, while using the uh, online phone directories. First, let me just say that I suggest that you exhaust all other methods before you try the Google approach. Uh, the reason why is that the number of false hits you get when you do a Google search, which I'm sure any of you know just from Googling anything, um, can be tiring, requires a lot of patience. Um, and of course, what you may be looking for might not be online yet. Um, but it's certainly worth a try if all else has failed. If you want tips on how to word your searches on Google, feel free to speak to a librarian at any of our branches. I will do one example Google search for you here to illustrate how I found some small-scale databases for County Down, which as you know is my ancestor's place of origin. So I've entered County Down Ireland genealogy into the search um, field, and you'll notice I put the quotes around County Down. That'll help narrow things down. As you can see, that this alone brought up 5 million results, um, which is a bit overwhelming. Um, the algorithm that Google uses to find matches will put what it feels are the most relevant towards the top. The first names that you see are actually advertisements. They sort of have like a yellow background behind them. But after that, um, after that yellow box is when the results begin. Um, the first link says the County Down Internet Genealogy Research Site, which sounds pretty good. Let's click on that to see what is on that page. 
It's a pretty unassuming website. It says that it was uh, copyright 2001, so some of the links may be out of date. That's something you'll always look for is the date of a website. But let's go ahead and go straight to um, links and other very helpful help, um, useful, I'm sorry, websites right there on the left-hand side. And this leads me to what I consider a gold mine. Um, it's so long and full of interesting information that I need to show it to you broken up in several slides. So this is what this individual considers the top must-see sites. Government departments and libraries and museums that have um, an interest in putting the county down. General sites, personal sites dealing with county down. And these are mainly family history. And you'll notice one of them um, has indexes like the Irish merchant um, from 1918 through 1921. So these are small databases, like I mentioned, that have small gems that you can find. Uh, genealogical organizations, researchers that you can hire that live in County Down, the newspapers that once existed or still exist that cover County Down, um, church sites for County Down. So that is sort of um, the kind of things that you can find. Now, I was very lucky in having that as my first search result. That usually doesn't happen, I have to admit. Um, so I don't want you to think that's probably going to happen. I was just uh, very surprised when I came up on the first one. Um, but due to time restraints, I need to move on to other topics rather than doing more Google searches for you guys. Um, so let's talk about gravestones. The gravestones are a valuable source of information, um, but I still suggest that you verify the information with an alternate source. Always keep an open mind. Like I said before, if two gravestones over, there is someone whose surname is spelled phonetically, or pronounced phonetically, you know, the way that you pronounce it, but it's spelled differently, still take note of it. Um, also, just look at the, the names around, um, on the gravestones around your ancestor. They could be family, they could be cousins, you know, in-laws, anything of that nature. Um, I personally love cemeteries and I have forever. It's one of my biggest joys. It's like the first place I go when I go to some place in your family history research is a cemetery because it's so interesting. The old crusty gravestones. And sometimes there's information on the gravestones that are helpful. For instance, I didn't know Patrick McNabb was a Freemason until I excuse me. <clears throat> until I traveled all the way to Pike County, Indiana and found his gravestone and there was a, a Mason symbol on it. So I had no clue. So things like that, gravestones can really be helpful. Um, where to find them? Of course, the County Heritage Centers in Ireland, but also there are some, a few online resources that I would suggest, um, like Find a Grave, which is all user-submitted data. So, of course, you know there could be errors, but these are people who either are just entering just their ancestors, but some people actually enter a whole cemetery and upload it so that you can search and possibly find your ancestors. I have found some people that way. And then, with that, since I like travel, I use, I use genealogy as a, as a reason to like travel. Like as my excuse. <laughs> so once I have found them on there, then I'm like, okay, let's, you know, I'm gonna go to Boston and see if that's really there and you know find it. So that's you know, you know, any any reason to travel, you guys. Um, and then also history from headstones. Now this there is a fee for this one, and it's also run by the Ulster Historical Foundation, but they have over 800 graveyards transcribed in Northern Ireland on this website. So that's a really great resource. And of course, there are print resources. Um, some that we even carry here in the genealogy and local history department um, that are really great, uh, especially those done by the Ulster Historical Foundation. They put out some really good product uh, out of that organization. Now, I said I was going to briefly mention heritage centers. OK. Um, there are heritage centers throughout the island that may be able to assist you in your research. Um, some heritage centers have even begun to digitize their information, not all of them, and it's still a work in progress. But to find the location, contact information, and websites of these heritage centers, visit rootsireland.ie, which is on your site. This is um, an image of the map, and each county on the map is clickable and will take you directly to the information for that particular county heritage center. Um, most of the heritage centers will do searches for you for a fee. Uh, those centers that do have online searchable databases um, charge to view the individual records, but not to search the index. So searching the index is free. Um, let's see. Next, we're going to go to Mocavo search engine. 
Um, this is a somewhat newer um, search engine on the scene. You have to have an account to use Mojave. There are two types of account though. There's a free account and then there's Mojave Plus, which is um, a paid, paid account. I have never used Mojave Plus because I haven't subscribed. Working here at the library means that I get <laughs> access to some awesome resources for free, so I can use Ancestry and all these other things. I don't need to pay for Macabo. But uh, much like Google, you can get a lot of false hits on Macabo, though not quite as many false hits as you get on Google. Um, it can also lead you to pay sites, so that's something to remember. It may lead you to a site that you have to pay to view the entry that is mentioned. On the screen, you see the top of the Macabo homepage. On the left-hand bar, a sidebar, I'm sorry, are several options, including looking at your search history, searching the SSDI, the Social Security Death Index, um, for instance. If you scroll further down the page, you'll come to what actually looks like it's a search form, but it's actually an advertisement for Macabo Plus. So just be um, warned about that. Um, you have to have a paid account to use that portion. So if we go back to the top and use the basic search function, once again, I'm going to search for my ancestor, Patrick McNabb. Um, after you log into your account, search for Patrick McNabb. Don't worry, um, the presentation's almost over. I know we're getting, uh, it's gone for quite a while now, but um, you won't have to hear about Patrick McNabb for much longer. <laughs> Even though I can talk about him all day. <laughs> um, so after I've entered the information in, go ahead and click search. And I've taken a screenshot of the first four results. The first, <laughs> ironically, is a, an entry that I created on a, on a Ancestry um, message board about my ancestor. When I was early in my research and I was still trying to find information and find like, fellow family members that way. But the other three, <laughs> um, the second and third hit would be helpful if I were doing this research for the first time. Both of them are references to books that contain my ancestor, and I know from research that these actually were my ancestor, not just other individuals with his name. Um, my ancestor was a farmer, so he does appear in the annual report of the Indiana State Board of Agriculture. Um, and he appears in the text of a history book. So that actually link is taking you to a local history book that has information on Patrick, which is helpful. Here are the remaining hits on the first page. Uh, two of which reference the cemetery, the floor cemetery that he was um, buried in. And if you have an ancestor narrowed down, narrowed down to a particular area, you can jump on Macabo just like I've done, put the person's name in quotations, and then the, the area, Indiana, Ohio, Ireland, County Down, you know, things like that. And you will get a search list that looks similar to this. So this is easier to use than Google, definitely. However, I still say that sometimes Google brings up things that you wouldn't otherwise find. And let's lastly sort of discuss surname distribution, other ways to find pockets um, if you haven't been able to do this using uh, American records. Irish Times, which is actually a newspaper, has a great little website, um, irishtimes.com plus ancestor, that has a free search engine, and it will actually show you what it had, what the records it had on um, line for the surname distribution. If you actually want to view the records it's looking at, you do have to pay a fee. But just to find the surname distribution pattern, you do not. So you can see here on the screenshot that I have, uh, once again, I've entered your nav in, and then I just click go. The results are as follows. OK, so it's got a nice pie chart to tell you where the majority of McNabs are. Um, it's saying that the first place is Tyrone, County Tyrone, which is in Northern Ireland. And the second place is um, in County Mayo. However, and we both know now, or all of us know, there's not just one other person here, we all know now, that my ancestor was actually from County Down. But if you look at the third largest piece of the pie, County Down is the third largest piece of the pie. Um, so that's what I was saying, is sometimes when you look at surname distribution, it may not always lead you directly, but you know, you look in County Mayo, you don't find anything, then you look at the next biggest piece of the pie. Um, on the right-hand side, it tells you the surname variations. So they also search for surname variations for you. You don't even have to search twice for different surname variations. And it tells you how many McNabs with one B versus how many McNabs with two Bs that they found. 
Um, and you'll also see the option to enter a second name to um, further narrow your results. So if you know the um, wife, say they were married when they immigrated, search by her name as well, and that will narrow your results even further. Or you know the parents' names of the immigrant. For instance, uh, Patrick McNabb's mother was a Murphy. So we could put Murphy in there, but it's probably not going to narrow them too much just because her last name was Murphy, and it's so common. But if you have a less common second surname, go ahead and put it in there, and it will narrow it for you even further. Okay, and this is the bottom of the same results page with some interesting information on it. It says, in the primary evaluation property survey of 1847-64, Tyrone has the most McNabs in it. Tyrone is also in Northern Ireland, as we know. County Mayo is second, with County Down third. There are also some nifty entries from surname dictionaries. Um, which have some interesting clues. For instance, mainly in Ulster, uh, uh, and then it gives you the Gaelic uh, name, version of the name, a Scottish clan um, settled in Ireland in the 17th century. It may sometimes be indigenous. Um, um, so I think that even though you can't look at the records themselves, that even the free option gives you some really good clues to go on. And of course, if you want to pay to see all those valuations and records that it's using, you have that option. Okay, the conclusion. Let's finish with a few key points. Um, each locale, country, county, religion, and country has its own traditions, history, and governmental regulation, regulations which will affect your research. So educate yourself about the area and resources available for your particular area of interest so that you can save time, effort, and frustration when you're doing your research. If you aren't familiar with the internet or online database searching, have someone sit down with you and give you a few lessons. This will make your online research much simpler. Both the Tech Center here at the Public Library and the Genealogy and Local History Department have regular workshops that may be of assistance to you in that regards. What are your family history goals? They'll be different for everyone. You may want to only go back to the immigrant ancestry. You may want to only go six generations back. Um, just set a goal and, and um, sort of strategize based on the, the information you found out about the uh, area that you're interested in on how to get to that goal. Make charts, download family tree software. You can get it for free um, through um, Family Search if you like. If not, you can buy some of the more fancy ones like Roots Magic or Family Tree Maker. Um, keep all, track of all the resources that you have checked. I have this nice list that is now massive of items that I have looked at. Uh, write down what pieces of information you are missing. Ask your family, close and distant. Um, for any information. They may be privy to something that you are not. I, that's happened to me on several occasions. What, figure out what your next step is. What information are you missing? Where should you look for that information? Um, by educating yourself on the resources available, as mentioned earlier, and where to find them, you can develop a strategy of where you need to look next to get over that brick wall. Try to do research in our records in the United States before um, looking in Irish records. I'm sure that myself or a librarian in the genealogy and local history department could give you a few ideas of where to look for that information. Leave no stone unturned. Look at everything. Take everything as a possibility. Uh, I found information about my county down family through a really odd place, which was um, a memoir written by a Catholic priest uh, called Eleven Thank God by Vince, Father Vincent McNabb. And it was just a memoir of, of his life growing up in County Down um, on, on the coast. This is not a thing that ever, everything to look at. It was an old religious book put out by the London Catholic Press, I believe. Um, you know, so really, you can find stuff anywhere, which is why Google sometimes is helpful, because I think it was through Google Books that I ended up finding that his name was in the book, because it had been um, digitized and searchable. So when I looked for McNabb, that came up. Um, verify, verify, verify. User submitted data in books and online can be incorrect. So uh, make sure to look, like when you're looking at a source, whether it's online or in print, check their sources. Where are their sources of information? Is it another individual? Well, then you might want to verify it. But if they're, if they're quoting actual records, then it's a little, you know, a safer bet. And cite the source of every piece of information that you find. So who created the record? When was it created? Um, where did you access this piece of information? Things of this nature. I would suggest that you take a look at the book Evidence by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. It's very exhaustive, but it lists every single type of record possible and how you should cite it. 
Um, and that book is also listed in the handout. So thank you for coming today. I know that I went over a lot in a really short time period. Um, so it's a little overwhelming. But if you have any questions, feel free to ask me or any of the librarians in the genealogy and the list department. One question. Uh, you said something about some uh, SAE. Right. It's actually like an international coupon that you can get at um, the post office. Obviously, you can't send American stamps over to Ireland, but the post office does sell. Um, I forget what they're called, but they're they're an international yeah, return yeah. return. Yeah, yeah. And it's last time I haven't done it in about three years, but last time I did it was about above fifty for those. Um, but that may have gone up. I'm not sure. I have a question. When you refer to Ancestry.com in here through the library, will that do a, an international site, like a site in Ireland? Some of the, um, not all of the records are available, all the databases, the Irish databases, but um, you can use Ancestry Library Editions. A lot of the indexes that I mentioned, for instance, are available through Ancestry Library Editions. Okay, so they also, I mean, they will give you some international, some Irish information. I thought it was just domestic U.S. information on the library edition, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I've used it to look at some of the will indexes and the Griffith valuation indexes. Okay. Now, um, of course, Ancestry, the company, has world edition, um, Ancestry.co.uk, which is very specific to the United Kingdom, and even I think has some Irish stuff on it. Um, and they may have more that Ancestry Library Editions does not. But Ancestry Library Edition here at the library will access a lot so of those indexes that I mentioned. The ones you've referred to here are available at the library. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you.